Exercise 3. Page 53. In this week's edition of our media programme Headline, we have with us in the studio two old hands at journalism, Jane McLeod and Matthew Wright. Matthew, let's get the ball rolling by asking you what your opinion is regarding sponsorship of newspapers. Well, to tell the truth, I can't understand why newspapers have yet to figure out that accepting money, albeit in the name of sponsorship, either from political parties or big corporations, will inevitably lead to their downfall. What's their alternative? Are they just supposed to call it quits and close down their presses? Well, as a matter of fact, yes. Just like any other business, if they can't manage to make a profit, then they'll go under. And anyway, how can they not make a profit? They make a fortune out of advertising and... But our quality newspapers, The Times, The Herald Tribune, to name just two, are national institutions. They're a part of our democratic culture. One doesn't allow a democratic voice to fall silent because they can't pay the rent or... You're taking the words out of my mouth, Jane. Sorry? Well, in a democratic country, freedom of the press is a given. Newspapers should be free to express what they feel is the truth. In no situation should they be used as a propaganda tool for this or that particular party. They must be an independent entity. When your man on the street picks up his favourite newspaper every morning, he does so with the belief that what it contains will be as objective and unbiased as can be expected in today's highly subjective world. The reader wants to believe that the lead stories and editorials are uninfluenced by any political pressure or, well, or else he'll buy a different paper. Let's talk about something a little different if we could. Jane. Do you feel that the role of a journalist has changed over the years? I mean, do you think that today's journalists are as dedicated as their predecessors were? Hmm, good question. Personally speaking, I wouldn't particularly relish having to cross into enemy territory or go into a war zone, but then I'm not a war correspondent. I don't think that it's so much that journalists are less dedicated or less courageous than their counterparts of, say, the 40s or the 50s. I think it's more that the face of news stories has changed. Or at least the way news stories are investigated has become more... Speaking of wars and war correspondence, I remember as a young reporter covering the big one, World War II for you young people who don't know what I'm blathering about. Anyhow, I can remember being told by my editor that what we could and could not say in our columns and stories was strictly controlled by the higher-ups. Now at the time, I thought that this control, it was censorship really, plain and simple, was justified. I mean, we were at war, and what we reported could be read by anybody. So it would have been rather foolish to print something that could weaken our country's position. Anyway, now that I'm a bit more experienced, I know that any kind of censorship is wrong. It robs the public of a very basic human right. Well. That is certainly an incredibly controversial issue, and one we could probably argue for hours. But I think the main point here is that nowadays, what with technology and all, a lot of uncertainty has been taken out of our business. I think it's much more difficult for the press to get away with distortion these days. I mean, there are so many sources out there that the press has to stick with the facts, or they'll be caught out for subjectivity and the like. Now let's move on to another topic here. Exercise 20B, page 59. Anything interesting on the telly? Couldn't tell you. Pass me the TV guide, will you? Here you are. Let's see. Well, there's a couple of films we could watch. Have you seen Proof of Life? What's that about? Well, it says here it's about an American guy who gets kidnapped somewhere in South America. An action drama then sounds interesting. Who's in it? Russell Crowe and Meg Ryan. Should be fun. What time is it on? 
quarter past nine. Ooh, wait! Forget Paris is on ITV Plus at nine o'clock. Forget what? Forget Paris with Billy Crystal. It's a really sweet romantic film. Should we watch that? To be honest, I'd rather watch the other one. Oh, come on, Peter. We always watch what you want. Every time there's a film I'd like to see, you say you want to watch something else. All right, all right, all right. Fine. Can I at least watch the news at eight? Well, I was kind of planning to watch the rest of that video. Susan. Oh, okay. Exercise twenty-two A, page sixty. Have you ever noticed that every time you turn on your radio, regardless of what station you're listening to, they're all boasting about the fact that they are number one? Have you ever wondered how they can get away with it? It's easy. Not everyone uses the same rating system. Okay, all the ratings come from one particular company called, let's say, ABC Demographics. But this company is out to make money. And they do that by making the particular radio station look good. What ABC Demographics does is allow stations to customize statistics to their best advantage. Figures from different survey areas, such as age groups, time periods, or demographics, are compiled and then juggled until a flattering result is found. Effectively, for a fee, the paying customer, the station. Can have ABC Demographics make its ratings reflect the numbers the station wants to see, and give numbers which sell. So when you're listening to your preferred click on the radio dial, beware of the station's claim of popularity. Apart from listening to your favourite tunes, you're probably being fed a line of highly selective statistics. It was 1888 when Nellie Bly approached her editor with an idea that would catapult her to international fame. Frustrated one Sunday evening by her inability to come up with a story for the week, she found herself wishing she were anywhere else. Any place would be better, even the opposite end of the earth. The thought quickly took on a life of its own. The next morning, she astounded her editor by proposing that she make a trip around the world. He turned her down flat, claiming that, firstly, as a woman. She would need a protector, and secondly, as a woman, she would need to carry so much baggage that she would never be able to make her connections on time. Nellie may have failed that day, but one year later, when her editor called her into his office and bluntly asked, "Can you start tomorrow?" she knew exactly what he meant. She took herself immediately to a seamstress and demanded a dress that would stand constant wear for three months. She pared herself down to the bare essentials, packing only those items necessary for keeping polite company. Regretting only leaving behind her jar of cold cream, which would have taken up more room than anything else in the bag. On Sunday, October the thirtieth, nineteen thirty-eight, thousands of listeners were shocked as radio news alerts announced the arrival of Martians on Earth. They panicked when they learned of the Martians' ferocious and seemingly unstoppable attack. Though the audience was actually hearing an adaptation of the H. G. Wells book *War of the Worlds*, many of them believed they were listening to a factual account. Before the era of TV, people would sit for hours in front of their radios, listening to music, news reports, plays, and various other programs. In 1938, the most popular radio program was the Chase and Sanborn Hour. Which was aired on Sunday evenings at 8 p.m. Unfortunately for dramatist Orson Welles, his show Mercury Theatre was aired simultaneously on another station. Welles, of course, tried to think of ways to increase his audience, hoping to take listeners away from the leading competition. For the Halloween show, Welles decided to adapt the well-known novel *War of the Worlds* for radio. By shortening the story, updating the setting. Wells managed to reinvigorate the book and make it more personal for the listeners. On Sunday, October the thirtieth, nineteen thirty-eight, at eight p.m., the broadcast began when an announcer came on the air and informed the audience that it was about to hear a version of the famous classic. The play itself opened with Wells coming on air and setting the scene. As he was concluding, 
A scripted weather report faded in, stating that it came from the Government Weather Bureau. The official-sounding report was quickly followed by a program of dance music, supposedly being broadcast live from the famous Hotel Park Plaza in New York. The music was soon interrupted by a special bulletin announcing that a professor at the Mount Jennings Observatory in Chicago, Illinois, had reported seeing explosions on Mars. The staged dance music resumed, until it was interrupted again, this time by a news update in the form of an interview between a newsman, Carl Phillips, and an astronomer, Professor Richard Pearson, at the Princeton Observatory in New Jersey. The listeners who had just tuned in sat in amazement as they heard a running commentary of Martians invading New York. The script specifically attempted to make the interview sound as realistic as possible. Though the program began with, and was interrupted by, announcements telling the audience that they were listening to a novel-based story, many people didn't stay tuned in long enough to hear them. At the same time, a lot of the radio listeners who had been listening to other stations turned the dial just as they did every Sunday during the musical section of the show. On this particular evening, they were shocked to hear news warnings of Martians attacking Earth. Upon listening to the authoritative and real-sounding commentary and interviews, and not having heard the introduction to the play, many believed the Earth was actually under attack. All across the United States, listeners reacted. Thousands of people called radio stations, police, and newspapers. Many in the New England area loaded up their cars and fled their homes. In other areas, people went to churches to pray. People improvised gas masks. Miscarriages and early births were reported. Many people hysterically thought the end was near. The power of radio had fooled the listeners. Now I'd like you to talk about something together. Here are some pictures on the theme of conflict. First of all, please look at pictures B and D and talk together about the differences and similarities between the two types of conflict depicted. I'd like you to talk for about a minute on this, so if I stop you, please don't worry. Well, as far as I can tell, the similarities are that both pictures show people in the uniform services facing a form of conflict. They are both there because they are following orders. But in B, they are being used to prevent any conflict occurring, while in D they seem to be acting in the role of the aggressor. They are probably fighting on enemy soil, or they could be trying to defend their frontiers. Yes, you could be right. I think the most important difference is that B shows the police and D shows the armed forces. True. There is a difference, but surely that's not the most significant difference. OK. Something else to notice is that the conflict is taking place in different situations. One is in a city, whereas the other is in a desert. So probably the police are dealing with a demonstration, or maybe a football crowd, and they're trying to prevent conflict on their home ground. They might even know some of those in the crowd, or be sympathetic to their cause. On the other hand, the soldiers will be facing opponents in unfamiliar surroundings and have no associations with the people they are fighting. Thank you. Now, I'd like you to look at all the pictures. Imagine that these pictures come from a photographic exhibition entitled News Photography Will Always Be There. Together, decide on how appropriate the pictures are for the exhibition and then select the two pictures you think would be suitable for the poster advertising the exhibition. Please talk about this for about two minutes. In my opinion, I believe the exhibition is going to show pictures to prove how important the photographer is in news journalism and how his job can put his life in real danger. Reporters and photographers are always there in the front line. Yes, they are very courageous people. Now, Sophia, what about picture C? I think it is an appropriate picture for the poster. It is scary, it's got lots of colours, it's nice. I think people would like this one. Yes, I agree, Guido. This photograph struck me as having a profound impact on anyone seeing it for the first time. To me, it shows the force of nature and how man, despite the technology at his disposal, has so little control over nature. 
We often see pictures like these broadcast on the news, in the summer with firefighters battling to extinguish the fires destroying our countryside. And just think what risks the photographer must have taken to get this shot. It would certainly catch the eye of passers-by. Okay, I agree with you. I also like A. It's nice. It shows happy people who are probably celebrating something. Maybe they've won something. Visitors would want to attend an exhibition with such a cheerful exhibit. I can see your point. We should try to portray positive features of the news, but do you think this one is suitable for the poster? Personally, I would definitely not include picture A. After all, the picture on the cover should impress the person looking at it, and it should transmit a powerful message instantly. I think this one is a bit too bland for our purpose. Pictures like this are too open in their interpretation of the subject. Surely the exhibition must have a purpose, a clear message to give. Does it matter if it's open to interpretation? But what if this was a picture of players winning a football match? That would interest and impress a lot of people. Maybe you are right. I suppose sport is always a topical subject and is enormously popular throughout the world. By putting this on the poster, people who are not so interested in the more depressingly negative connotations of the other photos may be attracted to the exhibition. That's what the poster is for to encourage visitors to attend the exhibition. This picture may be of famous players who would be instantly recognisable. Then people would be interested in the exhibition. We can't dismiss pictures B and D either. They too would catch the eye of potential visitors to the exhibition. Don't you think we see too much of this kind of picture? If we see the horrors of war too often, we become desensitised to what is happening. Also, news photography is most commonly associated with wars these days, so we should move away from that theme. Let's make this poster portray another aspect. But all these pictures are in the exhibition, so the visitors are going to see them when they go there. Fine, but I don't think we need to make war photography seem to be the main focus of this event. To me, they evoke really gruesome images, and we shouldn't be using shock tactics to get people to attend. Anyway, I'd like to have pictures A and C on the poster. To me, they would be the most successful in making people interested enough to want to attend. What about you? So now we agree on A. However, I beg to differ about C. I feel D should be on the poster, so I'm going for A and D. Thank you. Now, I'd like you to talk about something together. Here are some pictures on the theme of conflict. First of all, please look at pictures B and D and talk about the differences and similarities between the two types of conflict depicted. I'd like you to talk for about a minute on this, so if I stop you, please don't worry. Well, picture D shows what is obviously an armed conflict between soldiers, while the other shows what looks like a demonstration involving civilians. I agree. The main difference is between the people involved in the conflict and where the conflict is taking place. In picture D, the soldiers seem to be in a war zone, while the demonstration is taking place in a residential area. And despite the police presence, the demonstration appears to be peaceful and well organised. So, in other words, another major difference is the level of violence involved and how serious the situation is. And probably the cause of the conflict. In most cases, war is a result of conflict between nations but demonstrations are usually the result of conflict between the government and the public. But I suppose they are similar in that both kinds of conflict could spring from political issues. Yes, and we know that a peaceful demonstration can develop into a violent one, and then the possibility of casualties is another factor which is common. Thank you. Now I'd like you to look at all the pictures. Imagine that these pictures come from a photographic exhibition entitled News Photography Will Always Be There. Together decide on how appropriate the pictures are for the exhibition and then select the two pictures which you think would be suitable for the poster advertising the exhibition. Then suggest one other photograph you would like to see in the exhibition saying what it would add to the poster. Please talk about this for about three minutes. Hmm. We'll always be there. I think we need to pick at least one picture that shows the hardships and sometimes the dangers which are involved in being a news photographer. And that would bring us to a choice between B, C and D, I suppose. 
I don't think picture B would have a place, at least not on the cover of the exhibition posters. It attempts to show confrontation, but I think that picture D does this more effectively because it's much more immediate. Oh yes, picture D would be essential to this poster. It's this kind of on-the-spot reporting that would make people realize just what being a news photographer means. What about the other two, B and C? Well, I think that B attempts to show that domestic issues are just as newsworthy as international affairs, which they are. But I think C does this much more effectively. And it's sufficiently sensational, isn't it? Yes, and it's very clear that the photographer who took the picture did put himself in a very dangerous situation. But I do think that we should aim for some kind of balance. What do you mean? Well, the exhibition won't just cover the dangerous side of being a news photographer. Perhaps a positive image, such as the golden moment shown in A, would be better. The two footballers. But how does that blend with the title of the exhibition, which implies that news photographers make sacrifices and even compromise their safety to bring us these images? Well, the phrase "will always be there" might very well be interpreted as meaning "will be there," whether the occasion is a happy one or not. Hmm. I suppose if we use C and D. The effect might be a little overwhelming. Make it look as though news photographers believe that they place themselves in as much danger as the soldiers or the firefighters themselves. Good point. Yes. So I think perhaps the picture of the two footballers could feature. Yes, I think I'm inclined to agree with you after all. Do we agree that A and D would be the best choices then? A and D, it is. What about another photo for the poster? I think what would be really effective. Would be a picture showing the collapse of the Berlin Wall, or some other turning point in history that most people could identify with. What do you think? Yes, that would work. The poster would be much better if it were to show an event that most people found momentous and one that is easily recognisable, and that happened quite recently, say in the last twenty years. Right. What about another picture? Something a little different. How about having one with a more unusual approach? The poster could show a humorous moment in the life of a public figure or celebrity, when they were unaware that they were being photographed. As long as the photograph taking is not too intrusive, we don't want to imply that serious news photographers have anything to do with the paparazzi. This exhibition is not dealing with sensationalist issues. That's true. We'd have to be really careful with that one. No. I think your original suggestion is the best. Something like the Berlin Wall or some historic event of similar importance. Okay, so we'll add the Berlin Wall or a similar recent significant event to give a contemporary feel to the poster, but at the same time showing how news photography records momentous historical events for posterity. Thank you. As far as public transport is concerned, of all male respondents. Thirty-three percent said that they preferred to use the train to get to and from work, which differs very slightly from a figure of thirty-two percent for women. Of course, trains represent only a small part of all commuter services, because the vast majority of people are employed in their own locality. Now, when it comes to that other great British commuting tradition, the bus, thirteen percent of men were willing to queue for the bus, as opposed to just seven percent of women. And for those who envisage themselves as needing to travel to work in luxury, taxis polled a mere two percent of male respondents, as opposed to seven percent of women who were willing to go to the expense of being driven to work, while the percentage of men that preferred to drive themselves to work was fifty-one, slightly higher than the figure of forty-nine for women. As for pedal power, men seem to be more inclined to go to work on two wheels. With 11% of them responding affirmatively to the question as to whether they would be prepared to get slightly breathless on the way to work, with a corresponding figure for women being only 5%. It would seem as though men, at least as far as the results of this survey bear out, are more willing to expend physical energy rather than money on their daily commuting. When it came to the level of general satisfaction with public transport. Men were generally very satisfied with the rail service, while women recorded a verdict of moderately satisfied. Buses fared less favourably than trains across the board, 
with men being moderately satisfied with services, in contrast to total dissatisfaction in the case of women. Of course, it can't be overstated that public opinion surveys of this type are extremely susceptible to erroneous results and are rarely a good basis on which to base public transport policy in isolation. There's a whole gamut of social and other factors to be taken into consideration. Right, is everyone here? Right. Good morning, my name is Helen Hardy. I'm a driving instructor, and the university you're attending has asked me to give you a few general pointers about what driving in Britain is like, especially when you want to travel fairly long distances. Now, I know that the thought of driving on the opposite side of the road from the one you're accustomed to is rather nerve-wracking, but take my word for it, it's not as bad as you think. After the first few miles, uh, sorry, kilometres, you'll be wondering what you were so worried about. You'll take to it like a duck to water. Of course, it makes things slightly easier when the vehicles are all moving in the same direction, as is the case on the motorway or dual carriageway. The basic difference between a motorway and a dual carriageway is that a motorway has three lanes, whereas a dual carriageway has two. The orange-coloured strip on the left of a motorway isn't normally used for driving on and is referred to as the hard shoulder. It's used as a place to stop without obstructing other vehicles in the event of a breakdown and by the emergency services in the event of the road itself being blocked by an accident. Under normal driving conditions, you should drive in the left-hand lane. The middle and outside lanes are only for overtaking and you should always move back to the left lane as soon as it is safe to do so when you have overtaken the vehicle in front. Exit and entry points to a motorway are known as junctions and are given numbers to provide points of reference along the motorway. Getting on and off a motorway may be different to what you are used to. To start with, there is always a slip road a straight road which gradually converges with the main motorway, allowing traffic to speed up or slow down. This system greatly reduces the risk of collision. A feature that greatly improves safety on dual carriageways is a central reservation, which separates the two streams of traffic. This central reservation greatly reduces the risk of head-on collisions. In the event of drivers losing control of their vehicles, Crash barriers are placed along the length of the central reservation. Oh, I forgot to mention that dual carriageways don't have a hard shoulder, but they do have laybys, stopping places at the side of the road. These are provided so that people can stop to rest, let's say, without blocking traffic. Now, as I said previously, you should only use the outside lane of a motorway when you want to overtake. I know you're used to overtaking on the left, but this is not the case in Britain. You can only overtake on the right of the slower vehicle, using the middle or outside lane. If you do use the outside lane to overtake, you must leave it and return to the middle lane as soon as your manoeuvre is complete. In the event that you need to stop on the hard shoulder or at a lay-by, you need to let other drivers know by using your hazard lights. Hazard light should also be used when you see any kind of trouble ahead of you, a traffic jam perhaps, or the scene of an accident. In this way, you give warning to the people driving behind you about the need to slow down. When leaving a motorway, you should indicate your intentions well in advance and exit using the slip road. As soon as you're on the slip road, take your foot off the accelerator and reduce speed immediately. Some of them suddenly become quite narrow and windy. They can give you a nasty surprise if you're still going at motorway speed. Whenever you change lanes, regardless of whether you're overtaking another vehicle or exiting a motorway, always remember to signal. Switch on the indicator and let it flash three times before you make your move, so you can be sure that everyone behind you is aware of your intentions. The speed limit on British motorways and dual carriageways is 70 miles per hour. 
which equates to about 120 kilometers per hour. If you're ever in a born-to-be-wild kind of mood, just bear in mind that if you're caught speeding, the least you can expect is a heavy fine. And don't assume that you can drive as fast as you want just because you don't see any police cars. There are thousands of speed cameras scattered along British motorways. So if you don't want to find a note from the police in your mail, always drive at 70 miles per hour or slower. A final note. A good driver is not an arrogant driver. A good driver is a polite, considerate and careful driver. Whenever possible, give way to other drivers. And, most importantly, never assume other drivers are as good or as careful as you are. Expect the unexpected and drive defensively.